Fantastic, I'm really excited to be here. So when I was invited, I thought, oh, I thought it was only professors that could do this, but it turns out you can just be a doctor and you can come and do this. So very happy to be invited. Um, so uh, as we've just heard, so I'm from the University of Southampton. I've been there about eight years now. Um, I just want to sort of acknowledge my funding. So some of that comes from the university. We've got two doctoral training partnerships and you were told about those and what they are yesterday. One is sort of ecology and environment stuff from NERC. And one is more about biology and biotechnology and stuff from the BBSRC. And so in a year or a year and a bit's time when you're thinking, mm, maybe a PhD is for me, uh, please look into these doctoral training partnerships that we have. Uh, they're both led out of Southampton, but they have partners in other places. So you would be doing a PhD where you do spend up to a year at another location as well. And some of these BBSRC um, PhD studentships are earmarked for plant sciences and agriculture. So although we don't have a plant science department, we do have a plant science theme and we have plant science students, PhDs and everything. Um, okay, let's see if this works. Great, so just a quick uh, one sentence bio on me. So I'm an evolutionary biologist. I did my PhD in plant evolution. I did a postdoc in plant evolution and domestication. Uh, and now I study most things about plant evolution as well. And we use genetic techniques, we use whole genome sequencing, and we use something I'm going to talk about later called transcriptome sequencing. So I'm sort of hesitant to throw some of these words in. So genome sequencing, you probably kind of roughly guess what that is. You sequence the genome of a plant and you tell where it came from or what it's related to, or you find genes that are really important. With transcriptomes, you're looking at the RNA, so what's expressed in a certain tissue at a certain time point. And then if you can look at genes that are highly expressed in one tissue and lowly expressed in another tissue, you're starting to look at the genetic basis of certain traits then. So we do this and we study adaptive divergence in a very broad sense. Um, but one of these aspects is looking at domestication. So I genuinely think domestication is fantastic, and I've actually talked to the BBC about uh, doing some uh, work with them on this, so fingers crossed a couple of years' time that might happen. But domestication is amazing, and it's a really good model to study evolutionary processes. So it's, it's recent. So that means you know roughly what was selected on over roughly what time frame, roughly where in the world. So that's quite good, because if you're comparing a chimpanzee and a human, you don't really know what was going on six million years ago and what our ancestor looked like. But domestication, because it's so recent, we've got wild relatives now that probably don't look much different to what they did six to 10,000 years ago when domestication started. So we've kind of got a progenitor and our derivative, but both coexisting. So it's really easy to compare those. If you want to look at human evolution, you've got a human and a chimp and you've got this proto-human chimp six million years ago. And you don't know what that looked like, you don't know what genes were in that organism, but with domestication you do have that. So I think it's a really nice uh, example to study adaptive divergence. The progenitors derivative relationship, we, it's very easy to look at what's related to what, we can work out what the wild progenitor is, where it lives, what it looks like, that's really important. Um, and another kind of practical point is that there's all these seed banks all over the world. So if I want to study brassicas and tomatoes from, from other places in the world, probably a lot of them I can just request. And I maybe then sit there for six months and wait for them to turn up. But once they turn up, I've got all the seed that I need. So we've got projects on brassicas, tomatoes, and a bunch of these underutilised crops that were mentioned before. And most of these seed we've just got from either collaborators or from these seed banks. And a lot of genomes have been sequenced. So I have a PhD student looking at what adaptation in rice. And if you go online and you search for rice genomes, ten a penny, they're falling at you out of the, out of the, uh, out of the web. So you've really got lots of resources to start with. But you've got this kind of biological setup that's really ready to go to study divergence. <coughs> so it's really important. That obviously, there's no point studying things that no one actually cares about or don't mean anything. So we can work out where crops originated and then what the wild progenitor was too. What did it look like? What's changed? Massive changes go on during domestication. What genes confer these phenotypes? And I'm going to talk about this a bit, but we can find out genes that cause yield or larger fruits or pest resistance. These are all really important for breeding crops going forward. And also, some crops won't have 
all of, the or all of the genetic variation that's present in the progenitor. So we can actually look in the wild species and find, for example, a drought tolerance gene that we could then breed or even genetically modify into a crop and then make a GM drought tolerant crop going forward, feeding the world. That's really important. Um, and there's this kind of, in parentheses, it's very fundable as well. So studying adaptive divergence isn't necessarily the most attractive to some funding agencies because they might think about food security. But if you're studying domestication, suddenly they twig and go, ah, we should fund this. Even though I'm secretly studying just the evolution of crops, um, it's got this uh, really important applied implication as well. So this is my plan. So I'll tell you what domestication is. You probably have a rough idea, but I'm going to give you a slightly more clear idea, hopefully. We're going to talk about these domestication genes, so the genes that confer really important phenotypes. Um, then I'm going to talk about why we eat so little. And I don't mean why we eat so little food, because we all eat plenty of food. We're all perfectly happy to eat uh, sausage, bacon and eggs every morning when we get the chance. Um, but in terms of species diversity, we actually eat a tiny proportion of what is available to us. And then I'm going to end with this section on underutilised crops. So these are crops that aren't very well known internationally, but are locally very important in some parts of the world. So this is a really difficult, long and wordy definition of domestication, but it covers all the main points. So first of all, it's mutualistic. So we benefit from it and the plant benefits from it as well, because we get food, fantastic. We get food when we want it, because we know when to plant it. But the plant will get a benefit from that as well because we're going to weed it and fertilise it. We're going to uh, water it if it gets too dry. That's not going to happen in the wild. So the plant is benefiting and we're benefiting. Mutualistic. It's the purpose, and domestication wasn't a goal-driven thing, but what's happened is that we can now secure a more predictable supply of whatever we want. And it could be animals or plants. I'm obviously going to talk more about plants, but there are obviously domesticated animals too. Um, uh, both partners gain an advantage and it, it generally with, it's thought to increase the fitness of both because we have a more, the plant has a more predictable amount of nutrients and water and everything. It can grow bigger, stronger, etc. And we obviously get our food from that, so we benefit too. So it's mutualistic. Both partners benefit from the relationship. Now, it's not just about food. So just to remind you that, yes, when you talk about domestication, you probably think of wheat or rice or various things that we want to eat with our dinner. Um, but there's fibres we get. Cotton is a really nice example. There's dyes. We get uh, bright blues and purples from certain plants. Um, and in animals as well. And, I, you know, again, it's plant sciences. But we get other things from animals that we don't get from plants. Um, you might get companionship from the plants in your house, but more likely you have a cat or a dog. Um, that serves that purpose. And it's not just about the, the one target trait that you, um, that you look at a crop and say that's why we eat or grow that. Because it has to germinate at the right time. So selection during domestication actually gives rise to things that germ germinate at a high percentage rather predictably. There's not a lot of use having plants that you want to grow in one year, but you don't know whether the seed's going to germinate for two or three years. If you want to grow plants, want to grow crops, you ideally want them to germinate that year. Harvestability. So this is something that goes alongside probably when domestication occurred, that it's unlikely that the early domesticators um, looked at a plant and said, oh, that, that's a bit sour or that's a bit spiny. But over time, humans will have selected for the less sour, less spiny ones that make them either more palatable um, or easier to harvest. And storage qualities is another thing. So if... Uh, the early domesticators had a variety of things to choose from and some of them rotted within one day and some of them didn't rot within six months. You can see why they would choose one versus the other. Just to talk about the harvestability, so I've got two examples here. Uh, this is two types of rice. Nipponbari is one of the first ones that had its genome sequenced and it's what we call non-shattering. So if you shake that rice, the seeds don't fall off. But there's other types of rice, and particularly wild rice, where you shake it and all the seeds fall on the floor. Because in the wild, um, a plant would want to distribute its seeds, so it wants to shatter. But humans, unless they really like being on their knees picking up grains off the floor, if this mutation arose, they would select on this plant because it would be much easier to harvest it. So again, it's not something that was a target of selection, but it's something that probably was selected on during domestication. <coughs> 
And here we've got a wild relative of a, an aubergine. Uh, this actually, I took this photo in southern Spain a couple of months ago. Um, and if you zoom in, the, 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 it has these massive spines, kind of one and a half, two centimetre spines on the leaves. Now, the domesticated aubergine, for the most part, doesn't. So over time, humans will have selected on the plants they could, sell, they could harvest easier. And I had a poor PhD student working on this. So unfortunately, she had scratches down the back of her hand uh, for a lot of the time she was doing her greenhouse experiments because we were comparing the wilds and the domesticates. And there's something called the domestication syndrome you may have heard of. Now, it's, it's not completely universal, but there's kind of a set of traits that several crops have been selected for. So not completely universal, but most crops have lost their shattering. And this is most cereals and most, most legumes have done this. So they don't distribute the seeds, which means that they're easier to harvest. Increased seed size or increased fruit size, that just goes down to the fact that it's much more efficient to select, uh, to pick you know, a handful of tomatoes that are bigger rather than 50 tomatoes that are smaller. So over time, we select for the larger fruits, the larger seeds. We've got loss of dormancy. So again, we want things to germinate predictably at the right time when we've planted them. And there's something called apical dominance. So I will mention this in a second about another example. But this plant has got obviously got lots of multiple branches of these small flower heads. Uh, and this one on the right, this is called apically dominant because it has one apex and that dominates. So in general, most crops have some of these. And there's, there's other traits as well that are semi-universal as well. Now it only happened in the past up to 12,000 years um, and human, human chimp, I always give this example, humans and chimps diverged about six million years. So in a thousandth of the time it took for a human to diverge from a chimp to what we are today, in one thousandth of that time we've gone from a wild species to all of these domesticated species. Massive phenotypic changes, I mean I would argue that that wild brassica looks more different to those than we do to a chimpanzee in one thousandth of the time. Here we've got wild teosinte, that's the wild progenitor of corn. That photo is to scale. So in about 10,000 years, we've gone, gone from these little ears of corn that are about 10 centimetres long. Each of those little uh, uh, fruits is in uh, encased in a really hard shell that you have to smash with a rock. And then you pop down to Sainsbury's and you buy one of these and you think that's much more efficient than having 500 of those for your dinner and smashing them for an hour. Um, and there's other morphological changes. Wheat's a nice example. This is wild wheat with a relatively small amount of grain per, um, per ear. This is uh, bread wheat. This is actually a hexaploid. And it's clearly got you know, a massive amount of yield per, per unit. So we've got these massive changes in all these examples. And you can think of dozens and dozens of these. Um, massive amount of changes in very, very short uh, times. So what happened when domestication, domestication happened? What, did anyone benefit from this? Was it a great thing? And, and yes, it was. So pre about 10 to 12,000 years ago, that everyone was a hunter-gatherer. So they were collecting their dinner, they were going out, collecting food, uh, spearing animals, whatever they had to do to get their calories. Now with domestication, this actually allowed people to kind of settle down. They could set up villages. And they actually, because of the efficiency, I'm not going to say they had more time on their hands, but they didn't spend all their time hunting and gathering. So in the Fertile Crescent, for example, this is a region around two rivers called the Tigris and the Euphrates in what is now about Iran, Iraq, Syria kind of area. Um, we've got evidence of craftspeople and in in inventors. So again, being able to start um, exploring other ideas because there's time freed up from the hunting gathering. We've got evidence of some of the earliest metal tools, uh, some of the earliest writing, they all come from that part of the world. Um, and even empires and armies were able to be built up. And so any of these uh, populations that had domesticated crops and had become, uh, begun kind of agriculture, they were at a disadvantage in a lot of ways to other, pl other, other groups of people, other hunter-gatherers. So this is why they started to actually expand out of the, uh, the early centres of domestication and take over other parts of the world. And that's probably why nearly 90% of the humans in the world, they speak languages that are related to these early centres of domestication. 
um, primarily either the Fertile Crescent or China. So Fertile Crescent is where we have lots of uh, legumes like peas, we've got uh, wheat, barley, we're all domesticated there, there's sheep and goat as well. Um, and then in China we have uh, rice is the big thing, but we also have soybean and other things uh, in that part of China. So these are the two main centres of domestication, and the majority of people in the world now speak languages that are related to these. So I would argue that this shows that domestication gave these people, possibly through these approaches, uh, a, a selective advantage over other humans all over the world. So what happens when you domesticate a species? So I've mentioned that we study genomes. So um, this is kind of the, the, the approach we use. Um, when you domesticate a species, generally it's a, a small number of plants from a small number of populations that are selected on. So, oh, that one's growing well, I'll, I'll take that seed. Or that one's less spiny, I'll take that one out of the hundreds and hundreds of plants that are available. So we get something called a genetic bottleneck during domestication. Um, so we have some level of genetic variation. If you imagine, this is, this is just walking along a chromosome. These are all genes or other loci. This might be our amount of genetic variation in the wild. So it fluctuates a bit, but relatively high. Soon as you get domestication, you get this drop in, drop in diversity because we've selected for a smaller number of plants out of the total number of alleles and uh, loci that are present. Now, if we have strong selection for a particular gene, so let's say there's this dark blue gene here that controls fruit size, almost all of the genetic diversity at that locus is likely to be removed. Because, first of all, the humans selected a small number of plants, we have a bottleneck, and then the humans selected, that one doesn't have spines, I'm having that one. So they took that one and the next generation were potentially grown from that plant or a very small number of plants. So we lose almost all of our genetic variation at these really important loci. And I'm going to come back to why that's important in a second. So any gene that confer, uh, confers a trait that provides a selective advantage is going to be selected on. And I've already said about there's lots of different traits. So first of all, it's important to know it was unconscious. So Humans, 10,000 years ago, didn't look at plants and say, we need one of those with bigger fruits and we need to get rid of those spines and we need to make that one less bitter. It wasn't anything like that. It was, it was farming, it was collecting, and over time, unconsciously selecting for certain types. Oh, that one tastes better. You know, let's grow some of those. Or that one grows really well. Let's throw away all those other ones that haven't germinated or something like that. But it was unconscious. It can involve all these types of traits, so these are tastes and colours and harvestability, things we can see. But there's also things like vigour and dormancy that maybe we don't think about, but it's really important to have strong, healthy plants that are going to produce lots of seeds um, and this loss of dormancy that we can predictably get the, the yield that we want at the time that we want. So I'm going to go through some examples now of these, what I'm going to call domestication genes. Um, and you may or may not, more likely not, have heard of something called quantitative trait locus analysis. So I would normally, in a lecture, actually, I would show a schematic of this, but I don't think it's necessary. I'm just going to quickly say, so you take your two individuals that differ in a trait. So here we've got an example from shattering. This is, this is wild sorghum. It has tiny seeds, but the important point is that it shatters, so the seeds fall off. This is a domesticated sorghum, large seeds. That's not the important point. The important point is it doesn't shatter. So we've got a shattering and a non-shattering. So you cross them, make an F1. So that might be kind of intermediate for shattering, or it may segregate for shattering. So you grow up the next generation, the F2s, and you have some that completely shatter, some that don't shatter, and some intermediates as well. And you can then go through the genome, looking at molecular markers, just uh, alleles on, uh, on, on the chromosome, and you can say there's a part of the genome here that controls shattering. So that's basically how this quantitative trait locus analysis works. So in a small population, so in this example, 94 plants, they showed that there was this high association with shattering on chromosome 1. Doesn't matter about the details, but a small population of plants, and they said, oh, it's somewhere on chromosome 1. But chromosome 1, we're talking about millions and millions of base pairs, so it doesn't really narrow down what gene is involved. If you grow 15,000 plants, which... Um, I can imagine it takes a lot of time and energy and space, but if you grow enough plants, you can get smaller and smaller regions of the genome until you find a gene that's in that region. 
So zooming in on 15,000 plants, they worked out there must be something here that controls the shattering. And when they looked at that region, there was only one gene in there. So there was 10 kilobases. In there, there's a gene that's five kilobases long. So that gene has got to be the gene that controls shattering. And because things are normally named by what the trait they control or the mutation that they uh, confer, they, they just name this gene, gene chat shattering one. So this is one way you can work out where, and you can do this for any trait, this isn't domestication specific, but this is quite often used in domestication studies. So in this example, they worked out that a particular gene controls this shattering phenotype. Now another way you can go about it is actually using this data. So I've already shown you this is what happens during domestication. So if you have a bunch of wild genomes and a bunch of domesticated genomes and you compare them, you can find these regions of the genome. So there'll be a domestication bottleneck, and let's say 20, 30, 50% of the diversity is already lost. But if you find a locus or a region of the genome with very low or zero diversity, there may well be something in that genomic region that controls the trait of interest. So this is a way you can zoom in on what genes are involved in domestication. And then this final example is called, a, uh, this final um, analysis is called a genome-wide association study. So it's basically taking polymorphisms from throughout the genome and seeing which ones segregate, uh, sorry, which ones correlate with a phenotype. So I've just done a tiny example here. Ordinarily, you would have, you know, a few hundred plants, um, maybe, uh, you know, ideally, you know, a SNP in every, uh, a polymorphism in every gene in the genome would be ideal, but I've shown eight plants and five uh, genes. But you'll see at gene three, there's a complete association between whether there's a C or an A present, whether you have small or large fruits. So there's these multiple ways you can go about identifying genes involved in domestication. So what do these genes do? Well, this, I've given you the shattering example. Um, this is a, a gene from maize, and I, I mentioned about this domestication syndrome and this thing called apical dominance. So wild teosinte, highly branched, uh, lots of these very small flower heads, uh, cultivated maize, almost unbranched and it has you know one or two cobs will form on every plant so morphologically they're quite different and we've got this increase in apical dominance and this is an important trait to know the domestic the genetic basis of so um in this example they did uh, quite a cool thing they they crossed a, a normal looking plant with a with another maze which had very active transposons uh, te's or transposons are the same thing transposable elements so if you don't know what these are, they're bits of our genome that actually can move around. So we are about 50% of our DNA is made up of these transposable elements. Maize has a very big genome. It's about 80 or 90% transposable elements. But there was a, there's a line of maize with very active transposons. So if you basically cross those plants together, these transposons are going to move around. And if one of them pops into a gene, it's going to knock that gene out or certainly change the expression potentially. So this is what they did. They did this crossing. They grew 26,000 plants. So again, if you're studying domestication, you need a lot of space, apparently. Um, but they found three with these slightly odd branching uh, patterns. So they were expecting all the plants to look like a maze. This is what they crossed to. And occasionally, they had plants that were more branched. They didn't necessarily look completely like a teosinte, but they had more branches. And what they did is they, because they knew the sequence of this transposable element, they located it in the genome and worked out what gene was close to it. And again, because genes are named after phenotypes or mutations, they named this gene Tiacinte branched 1, TB1. So now we know what gene controls the difference between these two. Now, they then compared the DNA sequence, and slightly oddly, the DNA sequences were the same. So exactly the same sequence in, of TB1 is in Tiacinte as it is in maize. So that's kind of odd. But if you look at gene expression, you see that one is highly expressed, one is lowly expressed. So high expression in maize represses the formation of side branches. Low, low expression in teosinte, that gives rise to these uh, non-repressed, so therefore you get branching. So the sequence is identical in this example, but there's a mutation, and it actually turns out to be a separate transposable element in a promoter region that gives rise to basically double the expression in maize that you see in Tiacinte. Another classic example, so I'm just talking classic examples here. I'm not going to talk through everything because 
now that lots of groups are studying whole genomes in multiple individuals, more and more of these genes are coming out. I'm just going to go through some classical ones. So fruit weight 2.2, again, it's not very imaginatively named, but you can guess what trait fruit weight 2.2 confers. Um, these are just some examples. So this is, I've got a PhD student working on tomatoes. This isn't my work. Um, but this is the wild progenitor. This is called Solanum pimpinella folium. This is a traditional sort of cherry tomato, which we think is a sort of transitional point between the wild and the domesticated. And then this is just a domesticated tomato as well. So these are ones that Anne's been growing in the greenhouse. Um, and this fruit weight 2.2, it's a QTL. So they use QTL mapping and they found a locus that confers a change in fruit weight by about 30%. Now 30%, you think, well, it's, that's like a, not a massive change in the size of a tomato. But you can imagine how important that was during domestication to get that massive, in, relatively massive increase in fruit size um, from this essentially one mutation. And what they did is they mapped it to a genomic region and there were about five or six genes in there and they didn't know which one controls this trait. So they just took bits of this and put it into a wild tomato uh, to see what happened. Sorry, they put the wild allele into the cultivated tomato. So this is an example. This is without putting the specific region of the genome in, and this is with putting it in. So by putting the wild allele into a cultivated tomato, you get smaller tomatoes. And they obviously did lots of checks and stuff like that, and they found out that um, there's this particular locus in this region called uh, fruit weight 2.2. Now, why do we eat what we eat? So this is something that I've sort of... I guess over the last eight years, I've started to think about more and more because when I started my job, I was thinking, right, I want to study domestication. What am I going to study? Now I'm thinking about, OK, lots of people are studying domestication, but what don't we know about domestication? What, what's important and what's missing? And luckily, NERC agreed and gave me some money to do it. Um, but this is kind of the, where, we, where we are at the moment. So 90% of our calories come from about 15 species. That, that 15 species out of the 300 odd thousand that, that of species of plant. So that, that's a tiny percentage. And actually about 50% worldwide come from these three, uh, wheat, rice and maize. So there's these three big hitter crops. Loads of research has been done into these crops, of course, because they're really, really important. But half of our calories come from these species. And I was, uh, you sort of look at the data and you think, well, there's thousands of plants that are edible thousands, probably tens of thousands. And there's several hundred that are domesticated, domesticated. But we only eat, you know, I mean, I know you go into the supermarket and you buy an avocado and you buy a kiwi and you buy strawberries at certain times of year. So yeah, you don't only eat 15 things, but worldwide we're pretty reliant on just these 15. So thousands of plants are edible, but only a few are domesticated. So, so it, I've also, be, I've been talking to an archeologist in Oxford and he spent a lot of time looking at Neolithic remains. And there's very good evidence where wild plants were collected, but they never became domesticated. So it's like the humans 10,000 years ago, they started collecting some things in very large amounts, you know, like thousands of seeds they found in certain parts, um, certain remains. Um, but they've never really led on to anything because we don't eat them now. They, we wouldn't call them a crop and you probably wouldn't even grow them as a, uh, something wild that you want to just eat in the background. So they, they, they were cultivated, they were collected, they were possibly cultivated, um, but kind of abandoned as well. So in, at some point they just said, oh, well, this one's growing well, we'll do this one and it turns into wheat and we'll bail on that one because it's just not doing what we hoped it would do. So what is it about some species versus the other? And these are kind of my two, sort of my important questions in my lab. And we, we come at it from various different angles. Um, but this is my sort of thought. Are all the edible plants actually domesticatable? And it turns out domesticatable isn't a word, so don't quote me on that. Um, but, but out of all the hundreds and hundreds of plants that were possibly collected or even cultivated, why have a tiny proportion of them only gone on to become domesticates? So what this might mean is that there's some wild species that are domesticatable. So one of the things we're investigating in my lab is we're looking at crop progenitors, so the wild progenitor of a domesticated species, and we're comparing that to other wild species that are very closely related but have never been domesticated. 
So we've got, for example, wild tomatoes, Selenium pimpinella folium, and we're comparing it to other Selenium species that they have kind of berries that look a bit like a tomato. They may be a bit more yellow and not quite so red, but for all intents and purposes, they look kind of like the progenitor. So why was the progenitor domesticated and the other wild species not domesticated? And we've been doing that for brassicas for a bit. We're doing it in tomatoes now, and we're going to do a bit on rice as well. So this is the way my brain thinks about this, and you know, possibly people could disagree this is a good idea. But what happens during domestication? So we get selection on novel traits. So it might be the non-shattering, it might be larger fruits, it might be things. But we have to have a phenotype that arises, whether it's... Uh, uh, something that we can you know, visibly see, like a colour or a shape, or whether it's like dormancy or harvestability in spines and things. Um, but we need these novel traits, or at least, at least certain alleles at these traits to, to arise. So the first thing I thought was, well, maybe progenitors just have a very high mutation rate. So these odd phenotypes crop up more than in other species. So if you've got more chance of a larger fruit turning up and less spines turning up and bitter taste getting removed, if there's just more mutations, maybe that's why some species are domesticated and others aren't. The other thing is something about plasticity. So I'm not talking about, you know, actual plastic in the sort of um, food packaging sense of the word. Um, but plasticity is where you have uh, a genetically identical individuals can look different in different environments. So could it be that a wild species, when moved to a a farm 10,000 years ago, or a farm, or uh, you know, just a manure patch or something like that, could they look different and start the ball rolling in terms of domestication? And there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of people talking about plasticity and adaptive evolution, not so much looking at it in domestication, but there is a little bit I'm going to talk about. But we've got some work going on here. So I mentioned transposable elements which move around the genome. So this PhD student working on tomatoes, she's looking at transposable elements in wild tomatoes, and that's the progenitor of tomatoes, as well as other wild tomatoes. So do we see more active transposable elements, therefore giving rise to more mutations in the progenitor than we see in other wild species? And we've done a bit of work on this in brassicas as well, but I'm not going to go into that in much detail. But the other thing, so I just mentioned plasticity. So this is, again, tomatoes. This is uh, one of the wild, well, the wild progenitor of tomatoes. And you'll see in these three different plants, so these are genetically identical. They're full sibs of each other. We've got three different treatments. So control, so that's a nice big pot, lots of nutrients. In the middle, we've got nice big pot, crappy nutrients. So it's basically just sand and grit. And then on the right, we've got small pots. So relatively small changes in the environment give rise to fairly drastic differences in the phenotype. Now, what's important here, so if you imagine that this plant, it's, it's in a small pot, this one's got low nutrients. In the wild, the plant is probably competing with other plants, so you could say that small pot kind of matches that, and it may well be growing in relatively no, low nutrients. It's certainly unlikely to be fertilised or anything like that. So in the wild... This is what this plant might look like. If you move the plant to a cultivated environment, i.e. nice big pot, lots of nutrients, it gets much bigger. So is there something about these progenitors that means that when you move them to a cultivated environment, they look more attractive or they make more seeds or they make more fruits? So what we're doing now, we're comparing the progenitor to all these other wild species and we want to see if we get the same situation. Because it could be that the progenitor, whoops, it could be that the progenitor just is much more plastic in these important traits that we actually, um, uh, we, we, six to 10,000 years ago in sort of Peru and places like that, um, would actually visualise and say, you know what, I'm having that one because it's taller or I'm, it's, it gives me more fruit or something like that. So something we already know is that this actually does occur in Tiacinte. So this is our wild Tiacinte, this is our domesticated maize, I've already shown you this. And this is Dolores piperno, um, standing in uh, central Mexico. This is a Tiacinte plant, it's got a single stem, one sort of uh, relatively large head, looks actually a bit more like maize. 
it turns out this soil is really rubbish soil, it's very low in nutrients, it's highly exposed, this environment. So it looks like this plant, under different environments, can actually look more like a maize than a the typical teosinte. And actually, growing them in different CO2 and temperature environments does give rise uh, to a more maize-like ear. So modern conditions, that's obviously the CO2 and temperature we have now. Late Pleistocene, that's sort of 10, 12,000 years ago when we think domestication happened and it had lower CO2, lower temperature, and it actually gives rise to an ear that's a bit more like a maize ear than a, a teosinte ear. Obviously, these are genetically identical. So that's based on, right, we'll look at a few plants and we'll you know, measure some traits and things like that. The problem is that that's rather, um, uh, it, it sort of, it, it's not very objective. So um, what we need is more traits, and we don't just look at them and say, right, we'll do height and fruit weight. Transcriptomes do that. So I already said earlier what a transcriptome was. It's all the RNA in a particular tissue at a particular time point. If we sequence the RNA from plants or whatever we want to sequence, it's going to give us thousands of genes and their expression level. Thousands and thousands of traits that we can then look at plasticity with. So again, in maize they've done this. So first of all, genes in, in teosinte are generally more plastic than in maize. So there's more variability in maize. It's, sorry, more variability in teosinte. 2,000 genes were plastic in teosinte that are not plastic in maize. So we have something called assimilation. So lots of variation in gene expression in teosinte, but then no, uh, no plasticity in the maize. Now what they found, or what they said, was that they didn't find lots of domestication genes in this list of genes that had lost their plasticity. So they said maybe plasticity doesn't play a major role. However, slight caveat that they don't mention is that when these genes were identified, these domestication genes, it was mostly through looking at DNA sequence variation. It wasn't looking at expression. So we may not find this enrichment. So we decided to do this, and we did it in Brassica. And we, we started out doing it in Brassica oleracea, which is all your cabbages and cauliflowers, and Brassica rapa, which is all these beautiful, uh, beautiful things here. Unfortunately, Brassica oleracea doesn't ever flower when you want it to. So we bailed on that, and I'm just going to talk about the Brassica rapa work. But we looked at a bunch of these different cultivated types and the, the wild Brassica too. So first of all, yes, there's more plasticity in the wild. So we found the same as we found in, they found in maize, happy with that. And then the way we went about this is we said, right, what genes are differentially expressed between wild and domesticated. So let's say it's very lowly expressed in the wild and it's highly expressed in the domesticate. If there's this difference, we presume that selection happened or it's likely that selection gave rise to that change because we're talking about a few thousand years and a uh, significant, significant change in gene expression. So there are targets of selection. Then for any of those genes, we looked at plasticity. So how plastic is it in the wild? If it's highly plastic, it might actually push it towards the domesticated level. So was that maybe the, uh, did that maybe start the ball rolling? So we identified all these uh, differentially expressed genes, and then we measured plasticity. And we did find that differentially expressed genes, so genes that are high in the domesticate, low in the wild, or vice versa, they tended to be more plastic, significantly more plastic, in the progenitor in the wild species. So we think that Possibly, at least for a subset of these, plasticity started the ball rolling in terms of the genetic changes that were necessary to give rise to the domesticated phenotype. So we think we've got some nice evidence here. Um, just put my co-authors down there as well. We think we've got some nice evidence here that plasticity could have started the ball rolling um, for this adaptive divergence. Now, I've already said this. 90% of our calories come from 15 crops. So why is this a problem? Well, there's always the risk of disease and pests. So this is uh, the classic example. This is the Irish potato famine, uh, where a pathogen came in and wiped out huge amounts of the crop. And this is largely because one or a very small number of cultivated types were grown, and there was no resistance to that pathogen. Our staple crops are also at risk from climate change, and they're probably not the best in terms of nutrient quality or quantity. So when we think about climate change, we think about temperatures increasing. This is the expected temperature increase for these, uh, where these four main crops are grown. Um, uh, and there's these sort of different 
uh, RCPs, the, the ICPP, um, different levels of change basically. So RCP 2.6 is, right, get your bums in gear, we need to stop the CO2, and then we'll get this relatively low but not insignificant change in temperature. RCP 8.5 is basically, who cares, let's just let the climate change, and you get these massive changes over the next few decades. All of these increases in temperature are going to decrease the yield of these major crops. And this is the decrease in yield per degree C. So for example, uh, for this example in wheat, we've got a six, on average, based on different modellings, we get 6% six, six reduction in yield per degree C. Now if we look over here at wheat, worst case scenario, we've got a 4 degree, maybe even more, change in temperature. So we might have up to a 25% reduction in wheat yield if we go for this sort of uh, stand back and let climate change do its thing uh, scenario. And a lot of our major crops are seriously at risk from this. It's not just these examples. Um, the other thing is that we don't necessarily eat the crops that have the most nutrients in. So these are some of the more sort of common beans that we might have in our diet. I've got lentils here, kidney beans and stuff. Edamame is a good one. If you go to sushi restaurants, get, get edamame with your dinner. That's good for you. Um, but in general, they've got about less than 10% protein. And there's all these other types of legumes here that have 20% or more um, protein in them. We just don't use them very much. This is winged bean. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but if you go to sort of an international supermarket, you may see winged beans. Um, what I was amazed about was that this said zuki bean, which I didn't know much about. Turns out it's in these tins of beans you can buy in Sainsbury's. So if you're going shopping, don't buy kidney beans, buy your mixed bean salad, and you'll get at least twice as much protein in your dinner. Um, I'm going to come back to these in a second. Um, the other thing as well is that these things compound each other. So a change in CO2 and a change in temperature will reduce yield, but it will also reduce nutrient content as well. So for all of these crops, certainly these four on the left, wheat, rice, field peas and soybeans, when we get this increasing CO2, we get a reduction in the amount of zinc, iron and protein in all of these crops. So climate change means reduction in, reduction in yield and reduction in quality of the yield that you actually get. So it might be a 24% reduction in yield and on top another 10% reduction in protein content. So this is obviously really serious for the crops that we're currently growing uh, as our staple crops. So they lack diversity. Uh, we're only eating half a dozen of them or a dozen of them or something like that in, for the most part. And they're likely to be impacted by climate change. But there are hundreds of species, and I've already mentioned this, there's m well, thousands of edible species, hundreds of domesticates, but they're what we call underutilized. So they tend to be locally important. They're grown in parts of Africa, parts of China, very hot places, for example, very places that are prone for drought, because if there's a drought, the wheat or the maize that they would like to grow will generally fail. But one of these underutilized crops, and they might grow it on five or 10% of their land, at least that will survive the drought. So there's lots of very drought tolerant, very heat tolerant, underutilized crops. But on balance, they generally yield much lower than a, than a wheat or a rice or something like that. So on balance, it's still better to grow wheat and rice. But in a bad year with a drought or a heat, heat wave, you may get no wheat or rice from that farm. Um, so the yield in general doesn't compare to most staple crops. They tend to have, or some of them, especially the legumes, they have these anti-nutrient factors. So they reduce the uptake of iron and zinc. So even if they're full of iron and zinc, they have these anti-nutrients that actually reduce the bioavailability. But they can bring novel traits like drought tolerance or um, they can have, uh, so something like jackfruit, for example, has three times the vitamin C that you have in an orange, for example. So um, there's lots of these crops that have either environmental tolerances or certain attributes that we might want to take advantage of. And ch I've just got two examples here. So chickpeas and quinoa, 20, 30 years ago, and I vaguely remember that time, um, 20, 30 years ago, probably very few of uh, people in Britain would have eaten chickpeas and possibly quinoa was even like never even heard of. So within 20 to 30 years, we can get from an underutilized crop to a mainstream crop or relatively mainstream. So I've already shown you this graph. And what's interesting is the 1970s, there was quite a few publications that said there's all this biodiversity out there. It's full of protein. It's really good for this. It's brilliant for that. We should start exploring it. 
And then you go through this list in 2022 and you think, oh, really? Winged beans? What, what, you know, what's that? But all of these crops, they do have a lot of potential. It just, and we're at the point, actually, where people are really starting to research these crops. Um, uh, one of the ones I'm going to talk about now is uh, a lab lab bean. So this is some work I've been doing in my lab, and I'm just going to go through quick, quickly what we've done about lab labs. So this is lab lab. Uh, traditional legume, so it's got this pod, it's got these nice uh, uh, left-right symmetrical flowers. Um, it can be grown as a forage, so it can be grown as a sort of cover crop, and animals can just come through and eat it. Um, it's high in protein, it's good for the animals. Um, but also the beans are harvested, and it's very drought tolerant, so it's grown in parts of Africa and parts of India, where certain other crops might not grow very well. Uh, and I mentioned drought tolerance. So this is quite a crude investigation, but basically this, this group, they grew these crops and then they stopped watering them and just waited till they died. And they just had a, presumably a clipboard and went dead, dead, alive, dead, dead. And you'll see here that Lab Lab is on the left here because these are ranked by the amount of drought tolerance. Uh, the first death um, in the Lab Lab took 30 days. So a month without water, these plants kept going. And it took a month and a half for all the plants to die. And you compare that to things down here, we've got soybean down here in maize where first death is sort of 10 to 20 days. So very, very drought tolerant, um, this species lab lab. So I've got a master's student now, Anastasia. She's gonna do a PhD with me next year actually. She's been looking at transcriptomic divergence during domestication in lab lab. But one of the things she's doing is a bit of a side project, which is um, we've got the data for, is looking at nutrient content. And we've got here some data on iron and zinc. This is from, we've got wild lab labs, so the progenitor species, and domesticated lab labs, so the ones that are normally eaten. And they were given a drought um, or they were well watered. And you'll see we've got these changes in drought, um, changes in iron and zinc depending on the environment, um, as well as comparing the wild and the domesticates. So the domesticates are high in iron and zinc compared to other crops but the wilds are even higher. So there's adaptive variation out there we could tap into. And certainly for the wild species, you'll see that actually when the plants are well watered, you get a higher amount of iron uh, per, per kilo than you do for the, um, the droughted plants. So we've clearly got some things that are worth investigating in this crop and certainly looking at the genetics behind this as part of Anastasia's project. We've also done genome sequencing, so it's not difficult to sequence a genome these days. It's, it's difficult to do it properly, but it's not, um, you know, the, the heady heights of impossibility anymore. Um, so we've been doing this in Lab Lab. So this is just one of these classic circle diagrams. Each one of these around the outside is a chromosome. We've got all these, these sort of gene density and transposable element density. We do have a preprint on BioArchive if you're interested, um, and we've just had reviews back. Um, so we have to change some things in that preprint, but we'll come back to that later. Um, but we've sequenced the genome. That's relatively small for a plant. It's less than half a gigabase. Um, uh, uh, so it was relatively easy to do this. Uh, this is the work I was doing as part of this project. So um, I've been looking at Lab Lab for eight years now. And so what I decided to do was investigate this theory of there being two domestications. So this is all Lab Lab in the green here. These are all our other species. So we've got uh, Vignas. These are, what have we got there? Uh, Azuki uh, bean, um, Bambara groundnut. We've got common bean there as well. And then this is all Lab Lab. And so anything in light green that says Uncinatus, that's the wild species. Anything that says Purpureus, that's the domesticated. So we've got a pair of wild and domesticated here. And we've got a pair of wild and domesticated here. So we've got this kind of ancient divergence, and then we've got domestication, domestication. So that sets up really nice evolutionary stories there where we can study the, the parallel changes in those two domestication events. So just to finalize, so we're in the last minute or two. So I've just said it's not ex especially expensive or difficult to sequence a genome. You need, you need the right team, you need some bioinformatics, but it's not like 10 years ago where it would take you know, 50 people, five years or something like that. So we're getting to the point where we can sequence genomes. Um, and we just wrote a review where we said, actually, people are sequencing these underutilized crops, which is great, but we're missing a lot. We're still not doing enough to find the genes that are important. 
So pan genomes, so sequencing multiple individuals of that species and assembling those because there's so much copy number variation and presence absence variation between different individuals of a species that actually if we sequence one genome that might only be 90% of the genes that that species represents and you need to start looking in other individuals to find those genes that aren't fixed across every individual. We need population genomics so going back to lab lab if we only had one genome, we wouldn't be able to talk about this sort of thing. We wouldn't be able to analyse domestication. And trait data, that's what takes time. That's what takes energy and people and space. I've already mentioned those QTL mapping studies where you need 15,000 plants. We just don't have people or enough people generating enough trait data. And something that's recently come to light, there's been a couple of papers, certainly there's this one from the end of last year in Nature Plants, there's this sort of terrible thing at the moment that, that there's a lot of Western soci societies and, you know, I just want to make you aware that you're mostly part of that. Um, but a lot of species are being sequenced off continent in the poorer developing parts of the world. So in Africa here in South America, 90% of the genome sequences of crops that are native to that country have been sequenced and assembled in another country with no partner from that country. And I think that's a real shame because one of the things we are starting to lose with some of these crops is we're losing that indigenous knowledge. We need to be talking to farmers in Africa. You know, which accession do you think is best? Which accession would you grow if you think it's going to be a hot year? Why has these ones got white beans and these ones got brown beans? Rather than just, and I said this earlier, you can get all these seeds from gene banks, so I'm, I'm not going to say I'm immune to this problem, but you can get all these seeds from gene banks and you can sequence those genomes, you can be perfectly happy with it. Oh, I've done my bit of science, that's great. But talk to the people where the plants come from. You know, work with them, do, do collaborative work and things like that. So I just wanted to highlight that as something that's something to be aware of as, as young scientists, and I mean that in the least patronising way I possibly can. But as young scientists, you do have the ability to make sensible choices. So if you're doing any type of research that involves plants from other parts of the world, just, just keep this in the back of your mind that there's um, a level of responsibility you have as well. Now, I wrote that there and didn't realise that you all actually go away, apparently, and, and come up with questions. So I will just leave that there, and you've now got time to go and think about that.